I thought I would start at the beginning of my journey just to hopefully stir you and to give you hope. I failed grade 11 uh, twice, and I was expelled three times. Um, and then at the age of 17, God radically, radically saved me. And uh, within two months, I was walking home one afternoon from work. I was a, an appy in the printing trade. And um, God met me on the way to the bus stop and called me into the ministry. It was crystal, crystal clear. Uh, when I got home and I told my mom and my sisters they were standing in the kitchen, well, my two sisters packed up. Um, my mom was a lot more diplomatic. She knew I was a shocking student. She said, Malcolm, that's really wonderful. Do you not think perhaps you could just become a part-time preacher? I said, Mom, I know that God has called me into the ministry. Um, I entered the ministry at the age of 21. I had my first church. And uh, two years later, after in-service training and internal exams, I went to Rhodes University. Um, imagine a school dropout. Um, I went to Rhodes University, enrolled in the Bachelor of Theology, and um, it was a most wonderful experience. The soccer was wonderful, um, the squash was wonderful, the life at varsity was wonderful. Studying was a challenge. I don't think I understood one of my professors, and that's the truth. I got by by chatting to my friends in our late coffee dates in Rares and um, by doing the assignments and reading the books. I genuinely did not understand my professors. Then a few years later, um, when I was back in circuit as a Methodist minister, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in front of my congregation. And uh, that really infused the passion um, for the word that had certainly gone missing. You know, the devil catches you at your point of weakness. And uh, my weakness was I believed I was dumb, thanks to some teachers who helped me believe that. And when I started actually shaping adversity, uh, the devil got behind me and pushed me. And I got so stuck into the philosophy of religion that I came out of roads with some theology, but I'd lost the passion, um, I'd lost the word. Um, and so when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Lord kind of brought me back to, to basics, back to the centrality of Jesus and a passion um, for the Word. And then in the 80s, um, the, the, the renewal movement was at its peak. And there were great teachers like Bob Mumford and Derek Prince um, that we had the privilege of, um, of listening to. And many of you watching wouldn't have a clue what a cassette tape is, but God so ordained that cassette tapes were the, the, the main technology of that time, and we had the privilege of listening to all these great preachers and teachers from around the world, and I just, I just lapped all of that up. In the late 80s, I burnt out very badly, and I think like most preachers who burn out, we say, well, we'll never preach again, and, and I said that. And one day, I was praying in my study, and as I was praying, my eye fell onto one of my bookshelves, and there was a little New Testament that my dad had been given in the Second World War um, that he gave to me. Uh, it was like a real treasure. It had an olive wood um, cover on and uh, the, an inscribed Jerusalem cross, and that was one of my little treasures. And for no real reason, I just picked this little New Testament up, and I opened it. And it fell open at Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news. And I said, okay, Lord, I will certainly take up the preaching again. And I made a commitment to God that day in my study that I would preach the word. That I wouldn't preach my own ideas. That I would systematically discipline myself to preach the word. And so began a deeper journey for me in the whole area of studying theology and Christian doctrine. Now, I think most people, when you say doctrine, they kind of think, oh, here we go, theory, dull theology. No, friends, let's, let's renew our minds Doctrine is not theory. Doctrine is the teaching 
of Jesus Christ. Christian doctrine has at its center the person and work of Jesus Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it begins in Genesis and it ends in Revelation. The gospel story begins in the Garden of Eden where God shares blood. The atonement begins in Eden. And so from Genesis to Revelation, our doctrine is there and it's grounded and it's rooted in the Scriptures. So the essence of doctrine, Christian doctrine, is God's glorious plan of redemption for mankind that begins in Genesis and ends in Revelation. So allow me to share some pointers that will hopefully stir you to establish a vibrant Christ-centered doctrine empowered and inspired by the Holy Spirit. I think Dudley Daniel would be quite proud of me. I've got a whole lot of S's. I know he used, he used P's a lot, and I know Tyron uses P's a lot, so I'm using S's tonight. The first point is this. Sober up and see the need for sound doctrine. Paul, as you know, was a, a real father to young Timothy. And Timothy had landed in a massively challenging arena. If you go and look at the history of Ephesus, it was at one time the, the occult headquarters of the, 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 the known world then. I mean, it was a hectic place. And here's this young preacher in the, in the church of Ephesus. And, and um, for Paul, this is his son in the gospel. And so I'm going to be sharing a few things from the letter of Timothy of, of how this wonderful um, older man in God um, with this incredible theology, this incredible doctrine, um, coaches this young man, Timothy. He, he reminds Timothy that, that, that there'll come a time when people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal and not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of ple pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Imagine getting that word just before you go and plant a church. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure when you hear this, you think, yeah, that sounds like what we used to in our, in our life. So Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, he says, keep a close watch on yourself, something that Richard has just shared, and on the teaching, the doctrine. Listen to what he says. Persist in this. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And then in 2 Timothy 3 verse 14, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's the father's advice to this young son in the gospel. Secondly, set firm foundations. Understand how vital it is that you establish firm doctrinal and theological foundations in your life and ministry. Sharpen your skill. As I said, Paul's writing this letter to this young, this young preacher with a lot of instructions and, and, and challenging him and speaking to him about um, the false doctrine that's, that's rife and, and how he must sharpen himself. And so he says in 2 Timothy 2, he says, do your best, do your best to study, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The Amplified Bible puts it beautifully. Study and do your best to present yourself to God approved, a workman tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed, and listen to this, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. I want to say to you, discipline is a key to becoming skilled in sound doctrine. There is no shortcut to becoming skilled in doctrine. 
than to discipline yourself. I was a young guy. You must, you must imagine, I mean, I, I don't ever think, I, I, imagine me trying to read um, Shakespeare. I mean, we, we read the summaries. <laughs> and uh, I, I was a hyperactive guy, I probably still am, and I couldn't sit and study. But my testimony is that because God had called me, and because he'd put a passion in me for the gospel, I had to force myself to sit and read and study. And I would encourage all the young church planters, discipline yourself as early as possible. Set your mind on studying. Be a self-starter. You are accountable to God for what you teach and what you preach. Surround yourself with good scholars. We live in an age where there's the most incredible amount of stuff is available to us, literally at our fingertips. I am absolutely amazed at how much free stuff there is of good theology books, of commentaries. There is no excuse for any preacher to be under-resourced when it comes to skilling himself or herself in doctrine and theologies. I was very blessed in 1983 when I planted um, a church out of the Methodist church and um, God led me to Dudley Daniel. That was in 1983. And so every Friday, Dudley taught us. We, we had a pastor's meeting every Friday and Dudley taught us. And then we had other great guys teaching us. There were guys like Leon van Dahl and uh, Ian McKellar, Rigby Wallace, all those guys. And it was just it was just putting the word into us, putting sound doctrine into us, undoing the myths, and just plowing in sound doctrine. Added to that, I had the privilege of meeting Michael Eaton in 1995 at Bryanston. And he just came into my life at such an important time in terms of my own restoration out of burnout, but also from a theological point of view. And I've listened to just about every, every message he's ever preached I've read the whole counsel of God. I've listened to the whole counsel of God. And he's been one of the mentors for me. Archie Kendall is another great guy. He was very big buddies with Michael Eaton and absolutely sound in doctrine. Strong theology, strongly based um, in the word. You know, I need to say to you, the very master that we follow studied you know, I think sometimes people think that Jesus came with a prepackaged, a hard drive download <laughs> of Old Testament 501. No, Jesus submitted himself for studying. Jesus, where was he when he was 12? He was with the fathers, the rabbis, debating, asking questions, learning, growing in, in stature, theological stature. Where do you think all those scriptures came from that Jesus quoted? He put that into his life as a young Jewish boy. We need to emulate our master. And we need to discipline ourselves in study of the word and good theology. Number three, the story. The, the meta-narrative. Get a hold of the whole story. From Genesis to Revelation, because the gospel is embedded in every book of the Bible. God's plan of redemption is, is in the whole of the scripture. Get the flow of the story of God. Number four, stretch yourself. This is where self-discipline comes in. Stretch yourself. Give yourself tasks. Set yourself up where you have to study. So for argument's sake, you can tell your people, for the next three months, we are going to be going through this series. And it sounds great, but then you suddenly realize, hey, I've, I've committed myself to a, a massive task here. But you know what? That's good. Stretch yourself. Put things in the way that are going to challenge you to study, to search, to dig, to process. And I believe that is a godly thing to do. Number five, sound words. I love this, this verse from 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
Paul says, follow the pattern, listen to this, of the sound words. The sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, God, the good deposit entrusted to you. What's entrusted to Timothy? The gospel. That's what's entrusted to him. The sound words are the gospel that's coming through Paul. This man who was steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, who, who had such a grasp of God's plan of redemption through the Old Testament. And when he came face to face, face with Jesus Christ, the whole thing clicked into place. And of course, he's written almost two-thirds of the New Testament. And that's why it says to Timothy, um, follow the pattern of the sound words, the words of the gospel, as you've heard me preach. And God, that deposit, God, the deposit of the life of God in the essence of the gospel in your life. Treasure it. Guard it. Because Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the power belongs to God and not to us. The treasure, many think maybe is the Holy Spirit. If you look at the context, the treasure is the gospel. And you and I have the treasure in earthen jars to show that the power belongs to God and not to us. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. So he's saying, Timothy, listen to the sound words. Listen to the gospel uh, narrative. Be gospel-centered in your preaching and teaching. Search out the truth. Committed to finding, be committed to finding the truth on matters of doctrine. And then, finally, number six. Seek out mentors and teachers. I've always made it my business in life to seek out mentors. And in my early days of NCMI, like I've said, I just so appreciated Dudley Daniel, Leon van Dahl, the Rigby Wallaces, the Ian McKellars, and then, of course, the Michael Eatons, and, and, and seek them out. Seek those men who are grounded in solid theology and, and get to know them, get to know their teaching. And you know, this thought struck me. Every time you read a good, a good scholar like Michael Eaton or Artie Kendall or, or whoever, remember that as you read him, the one person, there are probably another 20 or 30 scholars attached just to him who he is uh, feeding off himself. And so, and so you begin to expand your whole um, a field of theology and um, deepen your, your life and your walk with God. So to, uh, Paul says to Timothy, God, what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. Ensure that you are doing your best to honor God with the gospel. Let me share a quick testimony with you. When I came out of Rhodes, I landed up in the Johannesburg Central Circuit in the 1976, the year of the riots. I didn't know who I was. My boss was the head of the South African Council of Churches. I was completely lost. And you know, I look back to those days and I, I felt so awful because people were coming. It was like hungry people were coming for me to feed them and I was, hand, I was handing out these wonderful um, food parcels. And then when they opened them, it was just crumbs. And, and the following year, I, I was transferred out onto the West Rand into the mining area. And that is where I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, God is so incredibly gracious. I wasn't looking for the baptism of the Spirit. My wife went up in a meeting that we had a, a visiting missionary from Zimbabwe. And my wife went up to renew her, her commitment. And I thought, well, I'm the minister. Uh, I better go and stand with my wife. And while I was standing there, uh, this wonderful guy, Gary Strong, came down to me. He never asked me what I wanted, nothing. He just said, Malcolm, put your hand out like a little child. He just touched, just touched me on the shoulder and he said, Lord Jesus, baptize Malcolm in the Holy Spirit. And I just felt this warm, 
molten liquid go over my whole body. And man, I was back on track. And having come back to the word, coming back to sound doctrine, I started repenting and I started praying for those people that I left in Joburg. You know, God is so incredibly gracious. I bumped into a number of those people and they had come to faith in Christ despite my junk little food parcels. God is really faithful. So as I say, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. As preaching pastors, that's what we've been entrusted with. What an incredible honor. Therefore, I want to encourage you, make every effort to ensure that you stay sharp, that you stretch yourself, that you search for truth, that you develop a passion for the word, because out of the word comes sound doctrine and sound theology.